I'm David Sweeney from the Higher Education Funding Council for England, where I'm Director for Research, responsible for our research budget and also for research assessment. I'm Jonathan Parker, Professor of Social Work and Social Policy here at Bournemouth University and Deputy Dean for Research and Enterprise in the School of Health and Social Care. I wonder, David, whether you could uh, explain to, to us uh, why the REF has replaced the RAE and why it's better. Well, there's no doubt that the REF does build on the RAE where uh, the results and the process received uh, a pretty good press last time. I think people had confidence in the way the panels worked and confidence in the process. So we're, we're not transforming what we're doing, but we're recognising that there was research which I believe was truly excellent research, which the exercise did not always capture. And I think it's right in looking at research which may not produce outputs that are immediately accessible in the way that the output element mm -hmm. of the, the exercise still does. Uh, but where we want to capture excellence in a contribution to society, it may build from a body of work, it may build from the uh, long time contribution of individuals or groups. So we just wanted to, to work broaden uh, excellence so that we captured different kinds of work. Now, we've also streamlined uh, and standardized quite considerably. We did get feedback after the last exercise that there was just too many differences between panels. So we've really uh, given a lot of attention to the panels this time to ask them are the differences really necessary because of inherent differences in the way that academic work is carried out? And it's perfectly clear, for example, that in clinical work there's many different things to in humanities work. So there still remain differences between the four main panels, but wherever possible we're standardised within those panels and indeed wherever possible across the panels. So greater standardisation, more streamlining, a broader approach to excellence an opportunity, let's be fair too, to trumpet to the government, uh, to the taxpayer, to the world, uh, more of the contribution that university research has made to society. If you believe that we're in the game of transforming individuals by educating students and transforming society through groundbreaking research developments, then you want to do everything possible in an exercise to recognise those groundbreaking developments. I think this will do that better. The pilot exercise uh, did that well uh, and we hope to take that through into the, the exercise proper. If I could ask you uh, a question related to uh, the ref that I've heard from a number of academic colleagues and that's that it can be potentially divisive uh, between academics in the same institution, between academics in UOAs, across universities themselves and that it doesn't really measure research in the round. It leaves other aspects of the academic job uh, out of the equation. Have you anything that you could say to that? Well, that, that's a complex question. I think that uh, the Research Excellence Framework is about assessing the quality of research. It's not intended to look at public engagement. It's not intended to look at teaching. And I think one of the problems with the, the REF is when people try and use it to assess things for which it wasn't designed. Uh, we think we've got a robust way of assessing the quality of research. We don't think that there exists a robust way of measuring the quality of teaching or indeed a public engagement. And I think one of the strengths of our selective approach to research funding is that we can fund based on robust measures of, of quality. Now, I think the device of things interesting because on the whole the Research Excellence Framework mimics the way that universities work. We are an institutional funder, we are not a project and programme funder. We believe that universities, uh, as academics working together and engaged with their communities, uh, with their stakeholders, we think they have something to add, some value to add, over just being a group of scholars working together. So we fund universities. And we pretty much respect the fact that universities divide themselves into different disciplines where cognate ways of working go together and take note of that in the way that the Research Excellence Framework is designed. So I think we would say that the assessment of research is driven by the way research is organised and managed in universities rather than us driving that by the way uh, the REF is organised. Thank you. Um, following on from that, I, I suppose many people have, have been uh, suggesting to me that by 
seeking to maximise um, the, the uh, quality score in terms of the uh, research excellence framework by chasing funding uh, on the back of that quality assessment that the REF becomes somewhat counterproductive uh, by limiting the assessment of different types of research, not really addressing the research per se. I think that might be a challenge if we funded all of the research that went on in universities. Mm -hmm. But the, the totality of research is, is vast compared with the, even the rather large research budget, 1.6 billion a year mm -hmm. in, in England, uh, that we have. So we can't attempt to fund everything. And it doesn't seem to me reasonable that we should attempt to assess research uh, which universities choose to do based on the private income, and a good thing too, or universities do on the basis of uh, uh, commercial support. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the exercise is intended at identifying world-leading research wherever it's found and using scarce public funds to preferentially uh, fund that. Uh, all over the world, research is a game, I'm afraid, about mm -hmm. chasing funding. And uh, some of that is done through projects and programs, some of that uh, through institutional funding representing a broad measure uh, of excellence. I think that there are many ways in which research uh, may be exceedingly valuable where it's not recognised uh, in the research excellence framework, but I think it's reasonable that those who are funding should recognise its value. So you don't believe that the REF and the emphasis on world-class research may have the unintended consequence of damaging potentially societally valuable national research? Well, I, I think we've tried to broaden the way that uh, research is assessed to take account of societal value. I think the national international thing is a confusion, though. There is, th those words are used really to assess the quality at different levels, not the geographic reach or spread. And I think that's really important when looking at uh, the new assessment of impact, where uh, although reach is a component, it's not just as simple as the number of people it touches or the ge geographic area it touches. I think the panels have been teasing that out in the information they've published about criteria. I think that, of course, any research uh, that uh, where the funding ceases will be damaged, but I think you've got to make the case to potential funders about the value and uh, funding uh, from the public purse through either the research councils or us as a funding council uh, is only for uh, a relatively small proportion of the, uh, the research in many universities. Yeah, thank you. Moving on to impact, which is of course a, a new element of the assessment uh, this time. Uh, again, there have been some concerns raised about uh, its meaning and about how it may be assessed um, and some degree of ambivalence or ambiguity perhaps in the way that it is defined in the uh, panel working criteria and, uh, and expressed perhaps by those uh, people who will be judging the impact. Are you sure that universities and researchers won't be disadvantaged this time by putting in their impact case studies in perhaps a creative way, in an aspirational way, but perhaps not in a way that we will maximise the impact um, for that university, for that project, or indeed meet those criteria that have given said? Well, there's, there's a loads of de load of definitions there, each one of which does require uh, some teasing out, which is why we ran a pilot exercise. Now, that brought together uh, a bunch of academics and a bunch of people who were using the research, many of them with close academic links and understanding of uh, universities and an empathy for universities. And they seemed, in those five pilot panels, to have no problem in coming together and uh, deciding on criteria. Now, it was a pilot, so they refined the criteria as, as they went along. And since then, we've had a very lengthy consultation exercise and a series of workshops to try and codify that better in the material we've just published. So I, I think we've done quite well at capturing the breadth of impact. And I think in a description of how the panels will handle reach and significance, uh, we've given a reasonable framework for assessment, but it will come down to the, the panel's 
to mm -hmm. interpret that. Uh, we, ha we had discussions with the panels about the level of detail they would provide in the criteria, and each panel, each of the four main panels, has provided quite detailed criteria uh, for universities to work with. But there's no doubt that some work will be assessed highly, and some work won't be assessed mm -hmm. highly, because that's the nature of the exercise. And I think we'll, of course, all look afterwards to see whether we have managed to adequately capture uh, societal value. Uh, I think I use the example uh, in the medicine panel. Uh, how do you manage to assess improvements in patient care alongside uh, advances in drug design, which will benefit patients, but will also produce uh, an economic return for a pharmaceutical company? Now, that led to tough uh, discussions in the pilot panel we had in this area, some of which mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to be able to listen to. And, and I did see that both people from both sides, as it were, of that seem to be able to have very constructive discussions and come to a consensus view uh, about, after all, classifying, as is mm -hmm. the challenge, uh, case studies into one of four categories. Okay. So it is almost an iterative approach, and this is the first time we're doing this. Next time we hear that the uh, percentage allocated to it will increase uh, uh, by another 5% perhaps uh, at, at least. Um, I presume that feedback will be taken from the panels to make sure that we are capturing that impact. Oh, we'll have extensive evaluation and feedback afterwards. I think we've been very clear this is a developmental exercise. Indeed, our aspiration is to give just a little more uh, weight to the assessment of benefit or contribution. But I think uh, over a, well, well over a thousand people will be involved in assessing these case studies. Uh, we'll have a tremendous base of evidence on which to uh, assess how well it's gone and uh, a period of time in which we can reflect on that, uh, no doubt consult broadly over criteria uh, for the, the next exercise and, and see whether uh, this is something that does give. Uh, let's remember what it's about is giving broader recognition of excellence. We want different kinds of research, some of which was quite difficult under the old system to be recognised as, as truly world leading. We want to have an opportunity for that to, to achieve a uh, four star rating and I, I think that'll happen but uh, that's why we're doing the exercise with the help of so many people. So I'm very positive uh, there about the, uh, the, the assessment of impact. I, I wonder if there's a, a concern though that this may privilege certain types of research and, and thereby um, stop the uh, stop people engaging as much in pure research, blue skies research, research that doesn't have an immediately identifiable impact. Well, I think by far the greatest uh, weight is given to work, which, if it is of that kind, will likely be. Uh, regarded highly if, uh, if peer judgments bear that out. I, I think we are giving an awful lot of weight to work which may be blue, blue skies. I think too, and I think this is going to be a fascinating aspect of the exercise, we are allowing, uh, um, encouraging uh, the contribution of case studies which go back with underpinning research over some 20 years. I would expect quite a lot of that research to have been viewed at the time as blue skies, but over the years in ways that could not possibly have been predicted, uh, a contribution to society has arisen. Uh, to me, it will quite likely validate the case for uh, really a very large proportion of our research funding going on work which has no immediate outcome or predictable outcome, outcome but by pushing back uh, the frontier of knowledge, we acquire work that in due course will be applied in, in ways we can't anticipate. So I think it's as much about validating uh, theoretical work as truly underpinning tomorrow's breakthroughs as in looking immediately for short-term breakthroughs because I've been in research for a long time, one way or another, doing many things, and it seems to me a, a nonsense to assume that uh, the impact on society is a tap that you turn on and uh, you get impact straight away. This is, uh, in some cases, a relatively short-term game. In many cases, it's a long-term game. Remember, too, that uh, from your group of academics, we're, we're expecting case studies uh, 
from about reflecting one in ten of the effort. Uh, there's no sense in which we expect the whole program of work to be aimed at impact. Absolutely no sense. But we do think that in the portfolio of work that any department has, or school, uh, whatever submitting, we expect uh, in that portfolio of work there to be uh, a benefit to contribution over, uh, a benefit to society over quite a long period that can be identified through case studies. I'll be astounded if that doesn't happen.